father of the dog, the mother is a bit tired. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, first thank you for coming. Such a large audience, we are relatively, from so many countries to hear an old man speak again on his, but your, of our, Dr. Waldo. I swore, you, you, you can hear, okay. uh, I swore, I swore that the lecture I gave in London uh, in the premises of the Kenneth Club on July the 7th, 2009 would be the last one in English, but as you know, it is difficult to say no to a woman, <coughs> and particularly if this woman is Sylvia Antopuski, who founded the international club Atibo. <coughs> I have so often spoken and written about the Dr. Bordeaux that it is hardly possible to add anything new. But today, the basic work has been done by Sylvian. She did a tremendous job. Today, I am not much more than a presenter. Sorry. Uh, a presenter, a reader. Sylvian is the editor. I only here and there stuck my oar in. One more word. A rumor. There are rumors on the internet. A rumor ran on the internet, and I must put an end to it. I have given many a talk and taken part in many a country, many a meeting all over the world. It has always been voluntary work, voluntary, which in good English means, as Dickens would have said, decidedly unpaid. I will not make an exception today so late in life because people thought that they was becoming rich from today. Uh, anyway, I must tell you that I feel really moved to meet to meet you all. I, I feel really moved to meet you all today. I hope to shake hands with you, with each of you, after the talk, if you're not too disappointed. <coughs> so, uh, let's examine the standard and to begin with the beginning. You know the... You know the book? I am to blame. To begin with the beginning standard, uh, we, we, in the FCI we have standards. Where does the term come from? Uh, of course, it seems to come from English. But before that it was French, and before that it was German. Maybe the Germans there don't know it. Uh, because, you know, uh, France in the 19th century was struck with anglo -Anian. We wanted more and more English terms, and standard was one, introduced in France, to were from England to France. But really, the term had, was French before and had been introduced into England from France. It was a flag, an étendard. And it comes from German because it comes from the verb stehen and heart. It stands firmly. So you follow it. You put the standard, l'étendard, you follow it, so you judges, you breeders, please follow the standard for this reason, if not for another reason. Let's come to the dog. It's a bit, a bit trick. Because dog, 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 what, what the many English people say, dog, D O G G D U E, uh, comes from the English dog. 
but not as a dog, as an insult. In the time of Chateau Gaillard, you see the chateau there, where King uh, the Lionhearted was, and those English people, well, English and French, because you know that Richard didn't speak English at all, he spoke French. But nevertheless, they didn't like the French, and they called them dogs. You French dog! And the French people heard that, and they thought it was the name of the dogs they saw before the English, of course, came with the master. So the term go in the 15th century uh, invaded France and, and really Europe, because in Germany, in Germany you have the, the, the Docke, and after that Docke, but the beginning was Docke. Und Docke. In all dictionaries, it, you could read, in all dictionaries of the 16th, 17th century, you could read that the dogs come from England. Maybe some people don't like to hear that. But it is the truth. Les chiens d'Angleterre, the dogs from England. In a way, they came from everywhere because they do know if you ever read my book that there were circuses in Bordeaux and the dogs came from everywhere, especially Belgium and uh, Spain and uh, England. Anyway, this standard is called the Jerusalem model because it was adopted in Jerusalem in June 1987 by the General Assembly of the FCI. It was proposed by Dr. Pashu, who was chairman of the FCI Standards Commission. Uh, but really, it was made uh, after the 1971 standard of the Dr. de Bordeaux, which I had drafted with uh, Dr. Luque, and uh, Mr. Pachou was enthusiastic about it, and so it was adopted by the FCI. Uh, you will find in, in, in this uh, standard a few words which you find in no other standard, especially no English standard. Because of course the English standards came before the French standards, you know that uh, the dog fancy is uh, an English invention. Uh, the first show I think was, I, I don't know if I remember, but it is about uh, 1849. Uh, I found a show before in Belgium, uh, interviewing. But when I said so to the president, to the uh, English president, he said, yes, but if you search in England, you will find another one before. And between me, which is a bit funny, there were only two judges. It was for setters and, and, uh, and pointers, uh, uh, and two judges. And the first pointer, uh, Isola, was the judge who set it. And, and the, first, the first setter, his master, was the judge for the other. <laughs> it's a bit naughty to say so, but it is a historical truth. Anyway, so you find terms like, like concave, etc. Why? Because in France, in England, you know, when the first clubs came, there were, uh, there were uh, fences from everywhere, workers, etc. In France, on the contrary, immediately the veterinary schools were uh, interested. And so they used their own scientific terms. And uh, I cannot speak here uh, of, of all those uh, studies in France, but you must know that one name is, is Professor Baron, Baron who uh, examined horses first and uh, dogs later on. So the dogs, 
forces were divided into three categories, as you know. Those that were, you will see on the pictures, if you can have the pictures, but anyway, it's, it's in the portrait. You will like the portrait, I'm sure you will like the portrait. So, uh, the animals are, when you see the outline, they are concave, this is like this, or they are straight, or they are convex. Convex, the greyhound. Straight, say, the setter, the Belgian shepherd. And concave, the bulldog. The dog the world, and others. But, Baron explained that when the dog is concave, he has a tendency to turn his feet out. It is in his nature, remember the term nature, it is in his nature. So when you have a, a dog to bother with feet that turn out, it's not nice to see, but it is in his nature. If the, turn, the feet turn in, it is against his nature. Be very strict with a dog with toes in. Thank you. <laughs> uh, because you must always judge according to nature. Thirdly, in a concave dog, the skin is thin. Is thick. In a concave dog, the skin is thick. Your veterinary nose. On, on the contrary, in a in a, in a, in a convex, in a greyhound, the skin is very thin, and the, the tendency is to turn the feet in. So we go with nature, but with selection, thanks to selection, we stop or we we break. We go against this tendency. We try to have a dog model with the feet in the axis of the of the body, but it is impossible because it is against his nature. Don't if, if you want absolutely uh don't do bordo with the feet in the axis of the body, you will not be a good judge because you want a dog de bordo like a Belgian shepherd, which is not normal. Now, uh, you find the term brachycephalic. Brachycephalic, scientific term, but very easy to understand. Cephalic is the skull, and brachic is short. The, the skull, <laughs> it's nice, you know. Uh, the skull is short, but not only the, the skull, because it is always a the comparison with plasticine. You know what plasticine is? Boys, girls play with plasticine. They have a piece of plasticine and they make a doll. Plasticine, French people, if you don't know the term, say la pâte en moutique. La pâte en moutique. You know the French people don't. Many of them don't speak English. I wonder why, because we teach them English during seven years, and after seven years they can't make a sentence. I think the teachers, I think, are the way. Teacher. So, uh, if you take this block of plasticine, you make a dog. If you want the dog to be tall, what you do? You press on both sides. Consequently, the dog is tall, but it is narrow. On the contrary, if you want it to be small, you press the other side, from up and down, and the dog is small, and it rips around, and it is low to ground. It is exactly what happens in nature. So, when you say brachycephalic, it is also brachymorphic. 
brachymorphic means the body is short. But it is it is for the same reason. Uh, you find terms like monosoid. This does not come from Baron, it comes from another. We were very lucky in France because in the end of the 19th century we had two sorts of geniuses. Baron and Mignon. Mignon was a vet of the army. Both are perfectly unknown out, out of France for two reasons. First, as good French people who didn't speak English. Second reason, the 1914 war. Everything stopped. But, I remember I gave a talk in Mexico, there were plenty of students from the veterinary school and also professors. They had never heard of Baron and they had never heard of Mignard before. Mignard saw the <coughs> molasses in, in London, in, in, in the museum of London. You see those that are being destroyed nowadays by Dutch. You see the big dogs with small men. It doesn't mean anything because maybe maybe it's in the imagination of the artist. Nevertheless, he saw that and he gave the term Molosoi to all those dogs which are stocky, rather small, strong, brachycephalic and brachymorphic. Molosoi means like a molossus. And he invented other terms like Hyoid, which is in French Hyoid, which means like the Greek hounds. That means like all the sad hounds, etc. Now, something important. Baron made the difference between the adjective harmonious and the adjective harmonic. Well, in English, harmonic exists, but is not used. In German, I don't know if the harmonic exists, but the harmonic, I don't know. Anyway, the difference is this. Harmonious, uh, harmonious, I take the definition in the Oxford English Dictionary, is pleasingly arranged. All the parts of the animal are pleasingly arranged. In, in this expression, you have pleasingly, it pleases, consequently, it's not exactly scientific. It's, there is a bit of heart in it, sentiment, sentiment. Uh, uh, on the contrary, how harmonic in Baron, listen to his definition, all of the parts of the body of the body. All of, of, of the whole, all the parts of the body conform to each other and conform to the whole. Every part, each part, sorry, each part conforms to another part. For example, the hindquarters are similar to the, to the forequarters. And it is, it, it conforms to the whole of the animal. It doesn't mean it is harmonious. The bulldog, the English bulldog, is not harmonious. People say, oh, isn't he ugly? But it is harmonic because it is normally, it is concave, it is short. It is wide, it is stocky, it is perfectly harmonic. Is the dog de Bono harmonic? Not completely, because it is a bit long in the body. 11, 10. 10 for the height, 11 for length. But almost harmonic. You see, a dog, when the dog is not up, harmonic, it is a mongrel. Mongrel in the street are not, are never, very seldom, harmonic. Pedigree dogs should be harmonic. So, 
you have, because you have three sorts of outlines, you have three sorts of harmonic dogs. It's a bit difficult, but you will see it in, in the book. It's well represented. Maybe, maybe, maybe. That's hopeful. <laughs> so, you have three sorts. Dogs like the greyhound. The greyhound is perfectly harmonic because it is, it is uh, convex. The proportions are long. It is high. It is relatively <coughs> narrow. The center is harmonic. The center is said to be zero everywhere. That is medium everywhere. Medium outline. It's, it's a straight in outline, sorry. Straight in outline, medium proportions, and medium size. And the bulldog is perfectly harmonic because it is uh, uh, in the outline con uh, concave, and the proportions are short, and the size in size is also small. So these are uh, things you should know as a basis when you breed and when you judge. Good. I don't know what happens. Ah, something. The show is good. The show is So I have two, two more minutes, I will tell you about the, do the term dogs, as you read probably in my book. In the Middle Ages in France, uh, uh, there were, uh, of course, plenty of dogs, those the English dwarfs with them during the Hundred Years' War, and also uh, uh, dogs from the country, of course. And you, you learn that in the southwest of France, we had Gaston Phoebus, a noble Gaston Phoebus, who was the real king. He had a court in the southwest. And he had 1,000 dogs, 1,000 dogs. He hunted every day. And he also invented the term chenille, where camel cups. Before Gaston Phoebus, there was no chenille, no camel. In, in, in countries where French was spoken, he invented so many things, and he, he made the first nomenclature of dogs. So it's why you will see the point that the FCI standard said that the dog de Bordeaux is a concave line monosoid. You, you understand those expressions, that is. Monosoid dogs, Piamina have a massive body, rather low to ground, concave, animals show a concave outline, not only the head, but also the body, as I told you. The skull is broad, the muzzle turned up, the top white hollow. The extremities, I forgot to tell you, in, in concave dogs, the extremities, and to the end of paws, are thick. On the contrary, if the dog is convex, the extremities are thin. If you don't believe me, shake hands with the ground and shake hands with the dog de Bordeaux. You will see the difference in your head. And the whippet, the whippet, you have nothing in your head. Good. Well, there's something. Oh, just a word here. You see if they see the stretching. It's a very striking head of the dog de Bordeaux with a very bad, a very bad V. It's not a V, it is a U. <laughs> you see, he, he is a bit uh, good doggy at that point. But a good dog, anyway. That's me, but don't believe it, because when I was young. Uh, uh,
God is still good. He shows a, a picture of years ago. So the, okay, you the next next. Ah, uh, with the general appearance, what I sent to you. Let's go on, and we count 
to a point of understanding with behavior temperament. If you have behavior, it's because of me. Because formerly there was only temperament. And I said that uh, I said that a dog is not an animal which lives in a kennel and is taken from the kennel to be to go to the show and then back to the kennel. Like alas, some children. Normally a dog lives with his family and they have not only their temperament but also a behavior that is a way of living. For example, in hunting, any hunter, any sportsman would tell you that such dog does not hunt like another dog. They are different in behavior. They behave differently. It's not a matter of temperament only. So, <coughs> to, uh, to uh, uh, speak of the behavior, I use the works of the German. Uh, Armin Heimer and I use this terminology. It's why you see in our in our standards the expression stimulus threshold. A stimulus it, it comes from the German. In German it's the Reizschwelle. Reizschwelle in French seuil absolu de réponse. It's how the a dog responds, you see, it reacts when there is a stimulus. A stimulus can be anything, a shock, a noise, a cry, music, something. And, and, the, and the dog, uh, for example, if an attack comes, a danger, some dogs jump immediately on the opponent. We say that the threshold, stimulus threshold, is very different to the stimulus threshold of a dog de Bordeaux, which has been compared to a uh, 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 locomotive of the old time. A locomotive of the old time, you have to heat it during a long time before it started. And the dog de Bordeaux is like that. If you say to a dog of the water, you are a bloody idiot, it doesn't react. Yeah? If you say so to some dogs, they jump at your throat. Uh, so a low stimulus threshold means that the accept excitability, excitability is great. The stimulus being a noise, a cry, etc. The dog of the is like a steam engine. But this you know because you have the dog de Bordeaux now. The head now, here you have different heads with different masks. And what shall we say? Uh, look at the one in the bottom with a, sorry, with a huge head. Formerly we tried to have that, but I tell you why, because when we try to, to to have a living dog de Bordeaux, it was not so easy in, in the 60s and even before. For example, you know that under the bombs in 1944 and 45, the German fancier tried hard to find the last dog de Bordeaux living in Germany. And the war was not over, he was under the bombs. I don't know his name, alas, because we should make a statue. What the man. And uh, uh, we, it, we, we had no, no, good, no good heads in the beginning because there was infusion of uh, different bloods. And so this head would have been enchanted. Now it is, be careful because there is a strong tendency to stop the exaggerations for the bitches to have their properties normally and uh, this is a bit too much really. We should not have 30% more round the head than the height at the widths. As you can see in the next in this head here. 
the perimeter of the head almost correspond to the height of withers. It can therefore uh, be more or less, or slightly more or slightly less. This means that one must not select heads having a perimeter exceeding the height of witness and the witness, sorry, by 20% on the pretext that they are spectacular, really they are monstrosities. Whereas you know those because we have made them long ago uh, with the proportions. You, you have seen me many times measure the, 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 the nose, the visual nose, and compare it to the length of the skull in the total border with other proportion, one fourth minimum, one uh, third maximum. This is the score. Yes, here. Uh, you will read this in your booklet, but see the first one on top, top left. Photo one shows an attentive dog with beautiful expression, wrinkles typical. Uh, the eyes of good color and the nostrils correct. The nostrils, formerly we paid no attention, now it's not. You know, in the beginning, when we started the dog brother again, in the 60s, I said to my judges, I was present in the club, I said to my judges, accept all the dog brother you see, provided they are dog brother. We have no time now, it's, it is and in the Bible. You see, have as many as you can. And later on, we will have selection. Because the dog had disappeared. <laughs> now it is, and, and believe me, I did not expect such number. I never dreamt of that. But now it is, there are many, and we can have a normal selection. Good. So here you see the line and skull and muzzle are typical because they are converging. Uh, which one? Yeah, so okay, let's go on because we will examine this on the other. Here they are more interesting. No, sorry, it's for me it's page 18. Is that yes? More interesting because they are not good. They are not good. Uh, for example, top left, you see, uh, remember, a muzzle parallel to the top line of the skull or descending is a disqualifying force. Uh, uh, wait a minute. The lights in, 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 I don't see, uh, yes, in the middle, in the middle, the, uh, the lines of head are parallel, and the head line of head is the skull in the muzzle. Uh, the dog lacking stop in the ear is uh, uh, at, uh, is at the back of the head. By the way, I must give you one about the ears, which bit of the but I don't know if we can do all that because it will last too long. Uh, formerly, we could see rose ears in. in uh, the now it is, we don't see many. The rose here came from the from the bulldog blood, because the bulldog and the English bulldog and the French bulldog of the Aquitaine, of the Bordeaux district. There were many in Bordeaux, uh, and the dog de Bordeaux are cousins, if not brothers, of course. So they have rose ears. I remember, uh, so I remind you of the definition of the rose here, it is placed backwards. And you can see the burr. You English people, how many English people and American people here? Do you understand the term burr? Burr, or in American you should say, I think, burr, something like that. B U double R. B U double R. Do you know the term? Well, this term is nowhere except in dictionary, in the Webster dictionary. And they say in the Webster dictionary that it is in the standard of the bulldog. And nowhere else. The burr in the standard of the bulldog is an uh, obsolete term meaning the 
uh, inside of the air, mainly uh, auditory, auditory uh, tube. The beginning of the auditory tube, you see. That was the pleasure of dog fanciers of, of, of the time in the 19th century to use words nobody understood. <laughs> it, is, it is called the jargon. Good. Uh, what time is it? It's time for the cars. Someone asked me to, to stop a minute for the car to today and then four, I think. We have to pay for So if we go on with this, we, we here we discover the, uh, the, the book you're going to have, the cranial region that's had a look at it, yes. And Yes, the one, the bottom of the note, sorry. The one uh, on the right. Very interesting because it's a bad, really bad skull, flat skull, not to be seen everywhere. And an overhanging file. Overhanging file. Because you know that say that the file should dominate the head. It doesn't mean it should overhang. When you have a cliff, if the cliff is overhanging, it goes forward and it is dangerous for people un underneath. And some of the model have that sort of scar. That is, the file is projected ahead, projected forward. Projected forward. This is very bad. Don't choose them. Of course, they said people say, oh, what a nice stop. The stop is very, very uh, pronounced. Yes, but artificially with this forehead which is uh, projecting the head. Well, yes. Ah. Yes, here, uh, Sylvian put the fault, you see, which is in all standards. Uh, any departure for the foregoing points, etc. There is, I will tell you, the history of this paragraph. It is added to all standards, and I tell you why. Because it was made, <coughs> it was first uh, uh, added in Great Britain, and this pleased a famous Italian judge, Mario Pericone. And Mario Pericone, I was then chairman of the Standard Commission. FCI Standard Commission and Mario Pericone insisted <coughs> to, for the FCI to uh, take this paragraph too. This is why it is there. Uh, it was it was okay, but after that the FCI has added plenty of of a paragraph like that, so it's no more standard because standard is not that that the paragraph that sometimes has nothing to do with the sentence. Uh, Yes, so the, the good the muzzle, the, the extreme bad muzzles are the good only ones, extremely short, and the one you see there, down faced. You don't see many nowadays, you see, the face goes down if you compare to the skull. Formerly we had plenty, because there was in our dog, there was the blood coming from uh, hunting dogs. Good. All these, uh, uh, all these uh, pictures you know, because you've seen them everywhere, so we want to see it. We, we see it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, speaking of the muzzles, you see on top, for example, the right, a typical muzzle, powerful, with good length, etc. The lips form a typical wide inverted V, you see there it is famous wide inverted V, which is not too acute. If it is acute, it, is, uh, uh, it, it looks like a Mastini, a Mastino Napolitano, and uh, if it is too wide, it looks like a Bulldog. It becomes a U. Very important when you judge, and the judge could see the chin. If there is no chin, you wonder if the dog is under shot or not. So you should check, and you come to the jaws, uh, a bit of history too. Uh, when I, I, I became a breeder in the Dog de Bordeaux and I read the first 
standard. The standard was an old one before 1971, of course, but in the beginning of the 60s. They said that uh, uh, all the borders should be overshot by at least one, one centimeter. And so I wrote immediately and I said one kilometer is okay. At least one centimeter, consequently one kilometer is okay. Ah, thank you very much. Anyway, so uh, we understood that in the draft and little by little because it was difficult to convince people, we came to absence of contact between the incisors. Absence of contact between the incisors is enough. So you have a healthier dog. And if we can see if the, the uh, pragmatic condition, that is undershot condition, is too much, you can see the incisors, the mouth, when the mouth is closed, it is a fault, severe fault. And if you see the canines, the fangs, as people say, then disqualify the dog. We don't see, we don't want such horrible uh, dogs. Uh, it was also difficult to explain that in, in the time. Now everybody understands. Now the the other faults are the twisted jaws, but you find that in all in all breeds. Of course, you must be severe with that. Uh, when a dog is not undershot, well, it's not good, of course. But how do you know a dog is undershot? There are two two ways. The incisors, of course, the under, the under jaw is in front, but also you can see the premolars, because normally the premolar, the fourth premolar of the, of the lower jaw is almost in front of the third premolar uh, of the upper jaw. And when the dog is undershot, this premolar goes forward and is placed between the fourth and the third. And if you see that in the dog, which is not uh, uh, undershot here, and you can detect this, well, there is a hope it will become undershot. Thank you very much. It's not easy to see sometimes, but interesting. All this is explained in the book, of course. Uh, now we look here, that is, the, yes, the, the dog in the middle. Uh, you see there, when, when you see a dog the bottle with a long rib here in front, you are almost sure there is something wrong in the undershot position. So you must check. Now the next one. If you allow me, I will do it. You see here, very nice uh, incisors. Pizza. We call it 
call it the pin song. The next one is intermediate, and I'm coming to the third one near the canine, which is the corner. Very important in the dog the border because you sometimes have corners which are so big and hooked that they look like fangs, they look like canines. And people say he has two canines. No. It is normal in the dog the border. There's plenty of dog the border formerly had this very strong hook corner inside. Go on. Yes, severe fault in sizes contained invisible, I just told you, so we we'll go on. <coughs> Next, yes, disqualifying faults. Ah, oh, the hanging, you know the tongue? How to judge a dog showing uh, a dog showing his tongue? Well, if it is just like that and uh, in, a, in a few seconds you don't see it, of course. But if it is constant, you might be severe with that. If there's something wrong in the, in the condition, of course. Or maybe in the uh, narrowness of the, of the, of the jaw. So that's a nice picture here. See all the teeth. Well, about P1s, just a minute for P1s and M3. Nowadays, nowadays, I preached for 30 years. And well, people didn't know, yes, a dog should have all his teeth, etc. And now, at last, the FCR has decided that P1s and M3 are not important. So if they are missing, it's not a drama. You know, uh, 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 I know that in Germany, uh, they are very strict with that. I have German friends here, I must tell them that when I see a German uh, uh, judge open the mouth of a dog vertically and plunge his nose into the mouth <laughs> to, <laughs> to see <laughs> Yeah, if he is a dentist, it's okay. But to see if there is a M1, ooh, there, down the pit, you see, missing, I always hope wickedly. <laughs> The dog will stop. <laughs> I am like the famous English tourist who followed the circus in France because he wanted one day to see the tailor eaten up by the lion. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yes, you see the, the typical inverted V, wide inverted V, you can see here. It exists, you know. It's not an invention. So, yes, with the video, you, you must prefer lips which seen from the front from a wide inverted V, etc. I spoke of this a few minutes ago. <coughs> the cheeks are important, the cheeks. Because in my time, the cheeks were clean of the dog. The cheeks were powerful, the muscle was very strong but there was no wrinkle, or a slight wrinkle. And nowadays, there are dogs with very deep, ugly wrinkles. They look like, seen from the, from the front, they look, look like orang mutan. <laughs> large, large, yeah, weeks. This is no good at all, not in the big comes from exaggerations in, in the, in the, uh, in the scale, in the dewlap too, it's related to the dewlap. Uh, same with the, yeah, same with the uh, position of the eyes, because the standards say that they are wide apart, but they have often said that the dog is no, no poultry, no hands, so you don't have an eye here and eye there. Simply, we must be reasonable and we should not make uh, uh, monstrosities. No bloated faults. It 
it's, it's queer, you know, because uh, in, in the 60s and 70s, we had no wrinkles anymore. They had disappeared, and we tried to have wrinkles. So one thing, one, one piece of advice, when you show your dog, formally, because they had narrow dogs, the handlers put their feet, one foot, inside the feet of the dog. And so the dog had the tendency to become wider. And with the faults, the same, handlers used to show the dog on a vertical line. Vertical, uh, uh, so, vertical tether, so all the wrinkles were added. And the dog, which had no wrinkles, suddenly had wrinkles. But now I see people with a dog uh, which is too, with, with too many wrinkles, too deep wrinkles, and they go on handling it vertically. So it becomes a monster when it should be so easy to take the uh, tether or the line normally. And then it out because the wrinkles are living in the dog world. Except if it is a bulldog. If the bulldog will stop living, and some of them are red, etc., which you must avoid completely in, in, in the dog world. So hold it like this, don't hold it like this, if it is particularly wrinkled or